Unlock the power of streaming TV ads for your clients with Disney's Hulu Ad Manager, the one-stop self-service tool for businesses of all sizes. With Disney's Hulu Ad Manager, you and your clients can reach engaged streamers, access an endless portfolio of premium content, and launch a campaign within minutes. You'll enjoy choice and control with industry-leading planning tools and a single dashboard. Get started today with Disney's Hulu Ad Manager at www.huluadmanager.com slash stream. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls. So in the Delphi case, Judge Fran Gull just unsealed the probable cause affidavit. It's out now. We're going to go through it. We're going to discuss what it says, what it doesn't say. And hopefully this can give our listeners more of a glimpse into what is this? What does it mean? What is the case as it stands against Richard Allen, who, of course, is accused in the murders of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, the murder sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The murder sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet, and this is... The Delphi Murders, the Richard Allen Probable Cause Affidavit. So the probable cause itself takes up six pages. I'm going to start at the bottom of the first page of the actual probable cause affidavit. So for the first two paragraphs, it's basically a quick summary of the facts of the case. Uh, These two victims were found deceased on February 14th, 2017, 0.2 miles northeast of the Monon High Bridge in Carroll County kind of goes into the location, what happened, what the Monon High Bridge is, um, what this area looks like. So it's giving you more context about the setting of this horrible event. And then we start to get a, a bit of new information. Through interviews, reviews of electronic records, and review of video of the Hoosier Harvest Store, investigators believe victim one and victim two were dropped off across from the Mears farm at 1.49 p.m. on February 13, 2017. A video from victim 2's phone that shows that at 2.13 p.m., victim 1 and victim 2 encountered a male subject on the southeast portion of the Monon High Bridge. The male ordered the girls' guys down the hill. No witnesses saw them after this time. No outgoing communications were found on victim 2's phone after this time. Their bodies were discovered on February 14, 2017. The video recovered from victim 2's phone shows victim 1 walking southeast on the Monon High Bridge while a male subject wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks behind her. As the male subject approaches victim 1 and victim 2, one of the victims mentions gun. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls, guys, down the hill. The girls then begin to proceed down the hill, and the video ends. So this is, I believe, the first official confirmation that a gun was present. That's correct. We've had information 
that is actually included in this probable cause affidavit. We did. We held it because we basically were told that it could be harmful to the investigation. But this does confirm some things that we already had. Um, I yeah, it's wow. In fairness, I recall some people on social media claiming they hear one of the girls say the word gun or something Mm -hmm. about a gun in the video. Yeah, that's been in the discussion for sure. So I think this has been swirling around out there for a little bit. And we're seeing also people have often wondered how does a perpetrator control two kids, you know, threatening people with a gun. That's a measure of control. So we're seeing a gun officially introduced into this narrative. We're seeing a bit more of the video being described. Let's keep going and see what else we can find out from this. Victim one and victim two's deaths were ruled as homicides. Clothes were found in the Deer Creek belonging to victim one and victim two south of where their bodies were located. There was also a 40 caliber unspent round less than two feet away from victim two's body between victim one and victim two's bodies. The round was unspent and had extraction marks on it. Let's pause for a second and talk about that. So this is what we, we'd we been told. Yes. And this is what we'd been told to hold back. Don't mention the bullet. So now we're going to mention the bullet since it's out there. What an extraction mark, as far as I understand it, means is basically if you eject a round, you're not firing the round, you're ejecting it, then that can leave tiny marks on the bullet that are also identifiable that could be traced back to a specific gun. I am not a gun person. I'm, I don't, I'm not familiar with that, but that is how it's been explained to me. Is that your assessment? That's my assessment as well. So you don't have, this is not saying that the girls died by gunfire. This is saying that somebody at the scene ejected around. And uh, left behind a bullet. Even that, I guess, may possibly be concluding too much. Because all we know is that a bullet was left there between where the two girls were discovered. We don't know if that bullet was left there during the commission of the crime or was put there before the crime or after the crime. All we can say for sure is there was this unspent cartridge. Located at the scene of the homicide. Now, this is going to be you know, up to law enforcement, up to the prosecutor, up to the defense to kind of push their own ideas. But in the case of prosecution and law enforcement, they're going to be saying that that ties a suspect to the crime. In the case of the defense, they may try to argue that there could be other reasons for this unspent bullet to be at the scene. I think the prosecutor would like us to believe that uh, bridge guy after he committed the crime no longer needed the the gun he ejected the cartridge and left uh the defense would say you know who knows when that that cartridge is put there right and we're going to have a bit more information about alan and his explanation for all this as we can further into the document uh next we start getting into some of the eyewitness testimony interviews were conducted with three juveniles and of course these names are redacted they advised they were on the Moan on High Bridge Trail on February 13th, 2017. They advised they were walking on the trail toward Freedom Bridge to go home when they encountered a male walking from Freedom Bridge toward the Moan on High Bridge. They described the male as kind of creepy and advised he was wearing like blue jeans, a like really light blue jacket, and his hair was gray, maybe a little brown, and he did not really show his face. She advised the jacket was a duck canvas type of jacket. She advised she said hi to the male, but he just glared at them. She recalled him being in all black and had something covering his mouth. She described him as not very tall with a bigger build. She said he was not bigger than 5'10". She advised he was wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. She stated he had his hands in his pockets. I will I will note that this is also a story that has been out there for a, a while about different witness interactions with Bridge Guy. And this is something we've heard, you know, from very credible sources in terms of what a witness saw a a very kind of, in retrospect, disturbing interaction with somebody, you know, being very unfriendly, not really reacting normally as you would when, you you know, just casually passing someone on the trail. You say hi, they say hi back. This, you know, certainly sounds like less than a typical interaction. She showed investigators photographs she took on her phone while she was at the trail that day. 
The photographs included a photo of the Monon High Bridge taken at 12.43 p.m. and another one taken at 1.26 p.m. of the bench east of the Freedom Bridge. She advised after she took the photo of the bench, they started walking back towards Freedom Bridge. She advised that was when they encountered the man who matched the description of the photograph taken from Victim 2's video. She described the man she encountered on the trail as wearing a blue or black windbreaker jacket. She advised the jacket had a collar, and he had his hood up from the clothing underneath his jacket. She advised he was wearing baggy jeans and was taller than her. She advised her head came up to approximately his shoulder. She advised she said hi to the man, and that he said nothing back. She stated he was walking with a purpose, like he knew where he was going. She stated he had his hands in his pockets and kept his head down. She advised that she did not get a good look at his face, but believed him to be a white male. The girls advised after encountering the male, they continued their walk across Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over Old State Road 25. Um, so I get the sense that we're talking about multiple witnesses here who are seeing Bridge Guy, the man believed to be Bridge Guy. Uh, I will note that we're not redacting this. This was a redacted copy released by the prosecutor, so the names are whited out. So we're getting pronouns, gendered pronouns, but we're not getting anything else. So we're just calling people, you know, she or he based on what, what, you know, they have in there, basically. Investigators spoke with Redacted, who advised she was on the trails on February 13th, 2017. Video from the Hoosier Harvester captured her vehicle traveling eastbound at 1.46 p.m. toward the entrance across from the Mears Farm. She advised she saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25 as she was driving underneath on her way to park. She advised there were no other cars parked across from the Mears Farm when she parked. She advised she walked to the Monon High Bridge and observed a male matching the one from Victim 2's video. She described the male she saw as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jean jacket. She advised he was standing on the first platform of the Monon High Bridge approximately 50 feet from her. She advised she turned around at the bridge and continued her walk. She advised approximately halfway between the bridge and the parking lot area across from Mears Farm, she passed two girls walking toward Monon High Bridge. She advised she believed the girls were victim one and victim two. Video from the Hoosier Harvest store shows at 1.49 p.m. a white car matching Redacted's vehicle traveling away from the entrance across from the Mears Farm. Redacted advised she finished her walk and saw no other adults other than the male on the bridge. Her vehicle is seen on the Hoosier Harvest Store video at 2.14 p.m., leaving westbound from the trails. Redacted advised when she was leaving, she noted a vehicle parked in an odd manner at the old Child Protective Services building. She said it was not odd for vehicles to be parked there, but she noticed it was odd because of the manner it was parked, backed in near the building. Investigators received a tip from Redacted in which he stated he was on his way to Delphi on State Road 25 around 2.10 p.m. on February 13, 2017. He observed a purple PT Cruiser or a small SUV type vehicle parked on the south side of the old CPS building. He stated it appeared as though it was backed in as to conceal the license plate of the vehicle. Redacted both drew diagrams of where they saw the vehicle parked and their diagrams generally matched as to the area the vehicle was parked and the manner in which it was parked. Redacted advised he remembered seeing a smaller, dark-colored car parked at the old CPS building. He described it as possibly being a smart car. Redacted's vehicle was seen leaving at 2.28 p.m. on the Hoosier Harvestor video. Okay, lots about the vehicle. That's been a mysterious element of this case for a long time, parked at the old CPS building. Investigators never put out a make and model. Now we're getting a little bit more clarity on what they may have been looking for. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. And what's also interesting is one of the witnesses described it as a purple PT cruiser. I don't really know cars at all. Purple seems pretty unique. And a PT cruiser also seems pretty unique. So I guess I can... Just speculating here, I, I can guess why they didn't release that, because that description is so specific that if I drove by the CPS building and I saw a vehicle that was not a purple PT cruiser, maybe I would not have reported it. 
and given more information. That's a very specific description, the Purple PT Cruiser. Yeah, I'm looking at an image of one now that is pretty specific. Uh, I will also note, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but the fact that to jump back away from the cars a little bit, as this one witness is walking to the Monon High Bridge, she observes Bridge Guy, and that's he's on the first platform of the Monon High Bridge. And that's before the girls got there. So I don't know. That's kind of interesting to me. Yes. I know there's been a lot of speculation about like what side of the, you know, what <laughs> where he came from and what exactly happened. But we're getting a little bit more clarity on what witnesses may have seen. Investigators spoke with Redacted, who stated she was traveling east on 300 North on February 13th, 2022 and observed a male subject walking west on the north side of 300 North, away from the Monon High Bridge. Redacted advised that the male subject was wearing a blue-colored jacket and blue jeans and was muddy and bloody. She further stated that it appeared he had gotten into a fight. Investigators were able to determine from watching the video from the Hoosier Harvest Store that Redacted was traveling on County Road 300 North at approximately 3.57 p.m. So if we assume that this woman saw Bridge Guy after the murder of the girls, then she sees him leaving the scene just before 4 p.m. Okay, yeah. And he's bloody, which matches the description that was given in the FBI affidavit for ron logan's property now the next paragraph just kind of gets into saying we there were a bunch of other people in the area at the time none of them saw anything basically what what would you think it means if this woman sees a bloody bridge guy walking on a pretty well-traveled public road just after committing the murders he really is not risk adverse yes he really is not risk adverse. He doesn't mind being seen. Maybe that could be a sign that he is somewhere close by that he's just trying to get to to kind of get away. I don't know. But that seems like an extraordinary risk. We then get some information from an officer who spoke with Richard Allen back in 2017. Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard Allen in 2017. That narrative stated, Mr. Allen was on the trail between 1330 and 1530. He parked at the old Farm Bureau building and walked to the new Freedom Bridge. While at the Freedom Bridge, he saw three females. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember the description, nor did he speak with them. He did not remember description, nor did he speak with them. He walked from the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. He stated there were vehicles parked at the High Bridge trailhead, however, did not pay attention to them. He did not take any photos or video. And then it gets into some technical language about an IMEI and kind of an MEID number. We'll have to look that up. I have no idea what any of that means. I'm, I'm assuming it's some sort of technical jargon around cell phone and cell phone data being located at the scene. So maybe they're kind of noting for the record what his cell phone may have pinged as. I don't know. If you know what any of that means, let us know. And this is what the investigator concluded in the tip narrative. Potential follow-up information. Who were the three girls walking in the area of the Freedom Bridge? So that's interesting. The follow-up is more focused on, like, who are those other witnesses as opposed to Alan himself placing himself at the scene. So, yeah, it's obvious that this uh, officer, whoever he or she was, did not seem to regard uh, Alan as a suspect at that time. Or at least that's not included in this tip narrative if he was. Now, let's jump back into the probable cause affidavit. Investigators believe Mr. Allen was referring to the former Child Protective Services building as there was not a Farm Bureau building in the area, nor had there been. Investigators believe the females he saw included redacted and redacted, Due to the time they were leaving the trail, the time he reported getting to the trail, and the description the three females gave. So they're basically linking that with the prior witness statements that were included in the probable cause. Like, the, this, is, this is the person they saw. Now let's get back into vehicles. 
Investigators discovered Richard Allen owned two vehicles in 2017, a 2016 black Ford Focus and a 2006 gray Ford 500. Investigators observed a vehicle that resembled Allen's 2016 Ford Focus on the Hoosier Harvestar video at 1.27 p.m., traveling westbound on County Road 300 North in front of the Hoosier Harvest Store, which coincided with his statement that he arrived around 1.30 p.m. at the trails. Investigators note witnesses described the vehicle parked at the former Child Protective Services building as a PT Cruiser, small SUV, or smart car. Investigators believe these descriptions are similar in nature to a 2016 Ford Focus. So a couple of things there. So basically they're saying that the black Ford Focus that Allen owned was in fact the same car as the purple PT Cruiser that was described by a witness. Uh, is that a hard sell, Anya? Do you think a person could mistake purple for black? Um, I don't know. I mean, eyewitness accounts are historically somewhat problematic. I mean, there have been a lot of studies indicating that, that people can have a hard time remembering, especially I always think that I would be a terrible witness because I can't tell one car from the other. Like, I just don't have that knowledge basis. Um, When I look at... At Google Images of a purple PT Cruiser and a black Ford Focus from, what was it, 2016? Yes. I don't think they look very similar. That's just my take. But at the same time, if you're going by quickly on the highway, maybe you just get a quick impression of something and that burns and, you know, maybe that's not super concrete. That's true, but I don't know anything about the makes of cars, but I do know colors. And I think I can tell the difference between a purple car and a black car. And as you say, this goes towards the notorious unreliability of eyewitness testimony. And if you have to start getting into the weeds and we think and say, well, we think what this witness, this witness said this, but we think he really meant this. Yeah. And you have to twist that in order to make uh, something work. It's hard for a jury then. I will say, if this were at night, I think we could be a little bit more forgiving. Color can be a bit harder to see in the darkness. If you Maybe it's a blue, maybe it's a purple, maybe it's a dark green. But we're talking about the afternoon. Yes. So that that doesn't really come into play here. So yeah, that's a little bit... You know, a PT, a purple PT Cruiser, that is a very specific, that is a very specific type of car. That is a memorable type of car when I'm looking at it. Again, I don't know anything about cars, but it, it's got like a weird, you know, car face, you know, it's, it's just kind of a bumpy, bumpy situation. So, yeah, my initial reaction is that doesn't quite fit together. But also it's worth noting that Alan says he was there, so it doesn't really he places himself at the scene. So we don't need to do any tricks to say, oh, yeah, that was his car. He was, in fact, there. Because he yeah. does. But, but I'm just saying the differences between a purple car and a black car. As you said, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable. That's not to denigrate any of these witnesses. They obviously meant well coming forward, did their best. It's just that human memory is a very fragile and flawed thing. And it can be difficult to reassemble even in the wake of something important because it it's that's just how human brains work i mean if we're just going about our afternoons not expecting to have to get quizzed on everything we saw that day maybe we did not lay down those specific memories that's true and i also think it's worth noting that witnesses can be very good at describing things they see, but they may not be able always to draw the correct conclusions from that. They say this car was parked uh, where the back of the car was facing the back, was facing the building. And they say, well, he obviously that was done to hide that license plate. And who knows why the driver might have done that. I'm going to say, like, if somebody quizzed me right now on what we did this afternoon, we went to Starbucks, we went to Jaggers for lunch. I wouldn't like I'd have a very hard time describing cars I saw along the way, people I interacted with. I mean, it would be difficult. I mean, I, I'm just saying that because I think a lot of emphasis has been put on witness accounts in this probable cause and in this case in general by people who are interested in it. And I think that's just 
that's certainly worth something, but I think it can get complicated because of the nature, the fragile nature of human memory. And yeah. And if if I'm in that situation, I do want to hide my presence from somewhere. I'm not going to be driving my PT cruiser there, my purple PT cruiser, because even in 2017, certainly not today, you don't see a lot of purple PT cruisers. I don't see a lot of purple cars. If I have a purple PT cruiser, even in a town like Indianapolis, I think people would see that and would remember that and might identify with. I don't see a lot of purple cars. Purple is my favorite color. So I think when I mean, when I see a purple car, I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I, I, I notice it. So that's yeah, that is surprising to see that in there. Then again, in in the terms of in terms of placing Alan at the scene, it literally doesn't matter because he does that himself. He came forward, said I was there. So it's kind of odd they included it at all. <laughs> so why, why don't we get to that with the next part of the problem yes, cause? Yes. On October thirteenth, twenty twenty two, Richard Allen was interviewed again by investigators. He advised he was on the trails on February 13th, 2017. He stated he saw juvenile girls on the trails east of Freedom Bridge and that he went onto the Monon High Bridge. Richard Allen further stated he went out onto the Monon High Bridge to watch the fish. Later in his statement, he said he walked out to the first platform on the bridge. He stated he then walked back, sat on a bench on the trail, and then left. He stated he parked his car on the side of an old building. He told investigators that he was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. He advised he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. He further claimed he saw no one else except for the juvenile girls he saw east of the Freedom Bridge. He told investigators that he owns firearms and they are at his home. Richard M. Allen's wife, Kathy Allen, also spoke to investigators. She confirmed that Richard did have guns and knives at the residence. She also stated that Richard still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. Okay, so here we have Alan placing himself decidedly at the scene, not just on the trails, on the bridge itself, and giving a description of his outfit that sounds quite a lot like the image that Libby captured on her phone, frankly. So, again, we were talking about the cars earlier, but he's literally placing himself there and saying that he parked alongside this old building. So he's putting himself into all of this, specifically basically what they're looking at. Yes. And the fact that he notes he has blue or black Carhartt jacket, and then his wife is confirming it's blue. I think that's interesting. The, and she confirms he owns guns. Yeah. So so we're kind of, we're definitely, this this guy is putting himself in this by his own statements. He's saying he was there. He's saying he was very much there and dressed like bridge guy. Yes. On October 13th, 2022, investigators executed a search warrant at Richard Allen's residence. Among other items, officers located jackets, boots, knives, and firearms, including a Sig Sauer model P226, a 40 caliber pistol with serial number U625627. Between October 14th, 2022 and October 19th, 2022, the Indiana State Police Laboratory performed an analysis on Allen's Sig Sauer model P226. The laboratory performed a physical examination and classification of the firearm, function test, barrel and overall length measurement, test firing, ammunition component characterization, microscopic comparison, and NIBIN. The laboratory determined the unspent round located within two feet of victim two's body had been cycled through Richard M. Allen's Sig Sauer model P226. The laboratory remarked, An identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class characteristics and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random, striated, impressed marks as evidenced by the correspondence of a pattern or combination of patterns of surface contours. The interpretation of identification is subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. Okay. A lot to unpack there. Lot, lot to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> okay, so basically his gun matches the bullet through 
the uh, sort of exit marks that were left on the bullet. But does it? Listen to this. Subjective. Subjective is the word that... The interpretation of identification is subjective in nature. So this isn't a foot race. This is ice skating. This is figure skating where you have judges saying, this is the best figure skater. It's subjective. Uh, I will be curious to see if that's contested. If it's subjective, doesn't that basically make it meaningless? No. If there's not an objective standard... I don't think it makes it meaningless. I think it raises the possibility you're going to have the police expert come on and say, this is it. And the defense is going to be able to come up with experts who say, no, this isn't good enough. It's just this person's, this other person's opinion. I think there's a lot of evidence that can get brought up in a murder trial that is ultimately somewhat subjective. And I would want, before I deem it irrelevant or something that's going to fall apart on the stand, I would want to know more about what is the science on this? How established is it? Are there standards? How are people trained in this? How subjective is it? Is it like a little bit subjective or is it highly subjective? So I would want to know more, but it's, it's certainly interesting. I will be curious because it's also interesting because what we learn later about what Alan's story about this is. Yes. So, um, because one could argue that if the bullet is not, is not linked to the killing itself. That is to say that the victims were not shot. Then there could be alternative explanations on why a bullet would be in the woods in Indiana, which is that people are out there shooting guns sometimes. So I was very curious to see, well, what is, what is Alan's counter, you know, (laughs) counter story basically. And we get to that later, but first let's go into this next section, which basically details when this all kind of came down. So just also noting that this is all going on in the background in, in October, we got a bit of an early glimpse of some of it, I will say, but for the most part, people at that point are still, you know, a lot of things go on in this investigation that you don't know about for a while. I'm just going to say that. Investigators then ran the firearm and found that the firearm was purchased by Richard Allen in 2001. Richard Allen voluntarily came to the Indiana State Police Post on October 26, 2022. He spoke with investigators and stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow the Sig Sauer model P226 firearm. When asked about the unspent bullet, he did not have an explanation of why the bullet was found between the bodies of victim one and victim two. He again admitted that he was on the trail but denied knowing victim one or victim two and denied any involvement in their murders. So that's interesting. Um, And I think... This will just kind of come down to how how solid is this bullet evidence? Because if you could you could interpret this in two ways, depending on what your perspective is, you can interpret it as he doesn't even have an explanation. You know, his gun shot off this bullet. He's not able to say, well, I lent it to my buddy or I was hunting. And then on the other hand, on the pro innocent side, you could say that if it's not very solid evidence, then he doesn't need to have an explanation because it's just not from his gun. So that's kind of how I take that. It's just kind of whatever. It's just interesting. He's not, he's not saying, Oh yeah, I gave it to my bud and maybe he did something. Yeah. You need to, or I was there earlier. You need to prove it was definitely from his gun and you need to prove that it was ejected from his gun during or just before or after the crime. And what I would be curious about, Kevin, with with this, he initially said to to defense, to, I'm sorry, he initially said to investigators, I have no alternative explanation. There's nothing. You know, I, I, I I wasn't there earlier. I wasn't shooting there a week earlier. I wasn't loaning my gun out to people. How difficult will be it? will, Will it be possible for him now to go to defense attorneys and say, Actually, there is an explanation. I loaned it out or I was there earlier shooting. Um, Would we expect to see something like that or what do you like what? It's always possible that in the moment when someone first asks you something, you don't remember an explanation. It's also possible that there is no explanation that is not even from his gun or that uh, someone could have. You know, he could have been shooting guns. He could have been shooting his gun with a buddy at some point, and the buddy could have scooped up some bullet shells and, for whatever reason, and dropped one later. 
it's yeah there's a lot of possibilities there. there's a lot of possibilities i'll note that there are certain investigative techniques that were once thought of as very um solid and then thought of in the public as solid but then kind of fell apart on further examination a, a prominent one is bite mark evidence for a long time people were convicted you know or, or you know cases against people were bolstered by oh the, your bite matches this bite on the victim and that has since been really heavily contested another thing is a uh, in in fire investigations sort of uh certain arson detecting techniques have also been called into question so sometimes junk science does make it into the courtroom and that's problematic for sure it's worth noting that and i'm not saying that that's what's happening with the with the round here that could be very much well respected scientific has an element of subjectivity but is generally considered solid but we're just talking about all the different possibilities here without knowing a little bit more. I don't feel like we can really conclusively judge any of this. Right. All right. I'll read the next part. Yeah. Carroll County Sheriff's department detective redacted has been part of the investigation since it started in 2017. He has had an opportunity to review and examine evidence gathered in this investigation Detective Redacted, along with other investigators, believe the evidence gathered shows that Richard Allen is the male subject seen on the video from victim two's phone who forced the victims down the hill. Further, that the victims were forced down the hill by Richard Allen and led to the location where they were murdered. Through the statements and photographs of the juvenile females and the statement of Redacted and Redacted, we're at the south edge of the trail at 12.43 p.m. east of the Freedom Bridge at 1.26 and walked across the former railroad overpass over Old State Road 25 after 1.26 p.m. and before 1.46 p.m. They walked the entirety of the trail and observed only one person, an adult male. Redacted's vehicle is seen on Hoosier Harvestor video at 1.46 p.m. and leaving at 2.14 p.m. And she stated that she only saw one adult male, Redacted, and Redacted described the male in similar manners, wearing similar clothing, leading investigators to believe all four saw the same male individual. I'll note that the descriptions from the witnesses are pretty consistent, but that a number of them mentioned not seeing his face, yeah. which seems... Could Make be. it difficult to do an eyewitness identification. Yes. Uh, and it's interesting... I believe that they all saw the same person, but I also... If you don't see his face, it's kind of... that. That dampens it so much in, in terms of pointing to any one specific person. And it's interesting. They say, we believe the person the witnesses saw was Richard Allen. We don't have the witnesses saying, oh, the person we saw, we identify him as Richard Allen. They can't do a lineup because, I mean, what what would the lineup be for his clothes, you know, yeah. or his body shape? I guess maybe if it was earlier in the game, if this was happening in 2017, maybe they could have a bunch of people in a lineup dressed the exact same and say, like, do you recognize anybody's yeah. form or, you know, does, I mean, but that would, that's difficult to do. Investigators believe the male observed by redacted and redacted is the same male depicted in the video from victim two's phone due to the descriptions of the male by the four females matching the male in the video. Furthermore, victim two's video was taken at 2.13 p.m. and redacted only saw one male while she was on the trail from approximately 1.46 p.m., to 2.14 p.m. Basically, you have witnesses basically indicating Bridge Guy's the only adult male on the trail. They're all describing him in, the, in a similar way. Not, not facially, though, because he's taking pains to conceal his face. Investigators believe Richard Allen was the male seen by Redacted and Redacted, and the male seen in Victim 2's video. Richard Allen told investigators he was on the trail from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. that day. Video from Hoosier Harvest Store shows a vehicle that matches the description of Richard Allen's vehicle passing at 1.27 towards the former CPS building. The clothing he told investigators he was wearing matched the clothing of the male in Victim 2's video and the clothing description provided by Redacted and Redacted. A vehicle matching the description of his 2016 Ford Focus is seen at or around 2.10 p.m., 2.14 p.m., and 2.28 p.m. at the former CPS building. Through his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to the Monon High Bridge 
and walked out onto the Monon High Bridge. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. Investigators identified other individuals on the trails or County Road 300 North between 2.30 p.m. and 4.11 p.m. None of these individuals saw a male subject matching the description of Richard Allen on the trail. Furthermore, Richard Allen stated he only saw three girls on the trail, who investigators believed to be redacted. Okay, so it's kind of a lot of repeating the same thing, basically. People saw somebody not not unlike Richard Allen. They didn't see his face. They saw someone dressed like how he admitted to being dressed. And there's bullet evidence tying him to the scene. Shall we go to the conclusion? Yeah. Investigators believe Richard Allen was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. because he was in the woods with victim one and victim two. An unspent forty caliber round between the bodies of victim one and victim two was forensically determined to have been cycled through Richard Allen's Sig Sauer model P226. The Sig Sauer model P226 was found at Richard Allen's residence, and he admitted to owning it. Investigators were able to determine that he had owned it since 2001. Richard Allen stated he had not been on that property where the unspent round was found, that he did not know the property owner, and that he had no explanation as to why a round cycled through his firearm would be at that location. Furthermore, he stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow the Sig Sauer Model P226. Investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down CR 300 North. Investigators believe he was seen by Redacted walking back to his vehicle on CR 300 North with clothes that were muddy and bloody. And, uh, okay, so they're kind of giving more of the timeline of, of the crime of, you know, he, he did this and then here's how he got back to his vehicle. And it is a good point they raise. He says he was there after 2.13 p.m. Why didn't anybody see him after 2.13 p.m.? Where'd he go? Yeah, where'd he go? Uh, another question this brings up to me is, at the hearing uh, last week, they made it clear they think other people were involved. But here we're saying, basically, in this probable cause affidavit, people just saw this one guy. And after the murder, people just saw this one guy walking back to his car. So who were these other people who were involved? And what was their role? What's outlined here seems to be that it could certainly feasibly be have been committed by one person. It does not get into motive. It does not get into why target these two girls when he was walking past a number of other juvenile girls that day. It doesn't get into any of that. So it certainly makes us wonder what else does prosecution have that would make them think otherwise. And I think you and I probably have some guesses, but we're not going to speculate here. We're not going to speculate here today. No. And um, I think... You know, that, but that, those are things that are not necessarily included in a probable cause affidavit. You don't have to show motive. You don't have to make the entire case. That's for the trial. This is just to get enough to get search warrants and arrest warrants and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's not necessarily surprising to not see that all included here. You're not shooting your entire, you're not boiling it all down to put all of your stuff in a PC, right? Right. Right. So to conclude, Redacted, along with the investigators, believe the statements made by witnesses because the statements corroborate the timeline of the death of the two victims, as well as coincide with the omissions made by Richard Allen. Further, the accounts relayed by Redacted and Redacted are similar in nature, and the timestamps on photographs taken by Redacted correspond to the times the juvenile females said they were on the trail and saw male individual. And then it's, that's it. So... It seems to kind of cut off. I wonder, I mean, could there be more that they redacted entirely? I guess not. But basically, let's boil it down. They have. And I'm just I'm just I'm putting it together in the way that the the state is arguing it. I'm not I'm not saying that this is objectively everything either way. They have the bullet. They have the witnesses who did not see his face. And they have basically general movements of the car. And they have his own statements putting him at the scene in an outfit that other people said Bridge Guy was wearing. 
and on the bridge. He put himself on the bridge. The thing that he's contesting is that he doesn't know how a bullet possibly, you know, ejected from his gun got on the property where the girls were found. Yes. <sighs> okay. <laughs> wow. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, so basically, the one thing it boils down to is the bullet evidence. Yeah. You have to believe that bullet that was found there actually can be definitively traced to his weapon. And you have to believe that that bullet was ejected there during the commission of the crime. If you believe those two things, you vote to convict. Yes. So that is what it's going to boil down. The defense is going to throw everything they can at that bullet about why you should should throw it out, basically. And the prosecution is going to be doing everything they can to be propping up the bullet and why you should very much uh, take that seriously. So the that- use of the word subjective and the identification that opens up a huge door that the defense is going to do everything to make that door as huge as possible. Yes. And the prosecution is going to be trying to uh, shut that door basically and, and, and show why that is, you know, if, if it perhaps is subjective, why it still deserves to be taken with the utmost seriousness. And, uh, yeah, I, I I would also wonder, I mean, we again, we said we had the bullet thing for a while now. It's also been circulating out there. So other people have actually put it out there on, on different channels and whatnot. We kind of reserve the right to step back on things if we feel it could be hurtful to the case. Now that it's out there, I don't really know how it would have been harmful to the case for that to be released. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll be honest. I mean, I I would rather be safe than sorry on an open case. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the amount of secrecy around this, I don't see. I don't I don't see it. I don't I just don't understand it. I really don't. I'm trying to. I, you know, the, the, the prosecution, you know, uh, kicked a huge fuss about not releasing this. It could have been redacted and released immediately. I don't understand yes. why. Uh, basically, they allowed uh, an opening for the defense to uh, make a huge media statement about how weak it was, and that's col- you know that could color people's assessment of it. I don't, I just I don't understand some of the strategy around any of this. Uh, so not just the probable cause affidavit was released today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the information uh, about the actual charges was released. Uh, these two counts are identical for victim one and victim two, but I will read one of the accounts. Nicholas uh, C. McClellan, being first duly sworn upon his oath, says that on or about February 13th, 2017, in the county of Carroll, the state of Indiana, Richard M. Allen did kill another human being, to wit, victim one, while committing or attempting to commit kidnapping of victim one. So we'd been wondering what was the underlying felony, and the underlying felony was kidnapping. Kidnapping. Interesting. Uh, That is interesting. And we would wonder, what evidence does the prosecution have to make them feel confident they can prove the kidnapping versus the murder? Now, of course, you have the video, which which purports in this to show that, you know, these two girls are accosted with a gun. You might think of kidnapping as something that is like, you know, so I drive up to Kevin and I force him in a car and take him away. But as far as I understand it, Kevin, it, it only requires minimal movement. Correct. Yes. If I pulled the gun on you right now while we're recording and I forced you to go outside to our backyard, that's kidnapping. Right. Yes. You know, basically having the girls be, they're on the bridge of their own, you know, their own free will, forcing them off the bridge. That's kidnapping. Yes. Okay. And another thing that was released today was, of course, the court's order basically saying that this should be released. And I'm just going to read what I think is the key statements from the court's order. The court finds that the state has failed to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the affidavit of probable cause and the charging information should be excluded from public access. 
the court finds that the public interest is not served by prohibiting access and that the protection and safety of witnesses can be ensured by redacting their names from the affidavit. So basically they're saying that as long as you redact the witness names, which they did, you know, it's, it's fine. And the other thing they, they argued about the witness names, McClelland also stressed harm to the case because there are other suspects possibly at play here. And the defense was correct in their initial media statements. This does not mention anybody else being involved. I guess what, what they're worried about might be subtext about, again, why was this guy targeting possibly Libby and Abby? Why, did he, why, was, he, why was he going to the bridge specifically? It does mention other juvenile girls he's passing by, he's having these interactions with. If the goal is to just kidnap anybody... Why, um, why Abby and Libby? All right. Well, that's all we have for now. We're going to be, I guess, continuing to look into this case. Uh, what's next? I guess the bond hearing, the bond hearing. Also earlier today, they filed a motion for a change of venue. Maybe we'll release a bonus episode discussing that. Yes. But in the meantime, yeah, if you like to if you like to discuss any of this, we do have a murder sheet discussion group on Facebook. Feel free to join that and uh we'll be curious to see what people think about this probable cause affidavit and the information included therein. But I think for us, we're going to reserve a lot of judgment for the trial. Exactly. Everyone's innocent until proven guilty. We want to see justice done for Abby and Libby. That's what we all want. That's what we all want, and uh, hopefully that will that will happen at some point. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.